Housing seems to be the anxiety of our times, and while some people are experiencing a bit of FOMO about making money, many just fear being priced out of the city that they live in. Housing is primarily expensive because we just haven't built enough, which is something I've talked about already, but it's also expensive because, well, this is what an investment property looked like in the 1960s, and this is what an investment property looks like today. Single family homes have been turned into an investment for those who can secure mortgages at endlessly low rates. That's right, it's your mum. So today I want to take a look at a movement that aims to solve the second part of the problem of treating a home as an investment, housing cooperatives. Now cooperatives are a massive topic, so instead of going down every boring rabbit hole, I'm just going to go with the most common case throughout. That way almost everything here is true anywhere in Canada. If you want more details, ask questions, we can work together to boost my rankings, subscribe, and join tens of people in following me on Twitter. Simply put, a housing cooperative is housing that's equally owned and controlled by a group of people. Isn't that a condo? No, idiot! In a condo with 10 units, each person owns a unit. The property title is for a little box, often an up in the air. That is yours, and the government has a record that you own it. Sure, you might chip in to keep the building maintained or replace a roof, but you don't own the building. Whereas in a co-op with 10 units, you don't own your little box. Instead, you own a share of 10% of everything. So a co-op has to be a building? No, idiot! Just like a condo, a co-op can be one of several buildings, or a piece of land, or for co-ops, it can even be a business. In fact, a co-op is just a legal entity for a thing owned by a group of people and governed by your Provincial Cooperatives Act. So isn't a co-op a corporation? Mm, yes, you're fucking smart. But its shares are equally owned by all of its members and usually it's a not-for-profit, which means it can't distribute a dividend to shareholders. In this video, we're obviously going to be talking about housing co-ops, but there are many sorts of co-ops. A lot of the time you don't even realize things are co-ops. The first co-op started in the 1840s in England, and they were retail co-ops. And we still have those in Canada. Anyone who's been to the far north knows that they're a staple of life there. These days, though, co-ops usually exist as agricultural cooperatives, credit unions, and in places where something bordering a cartel works well for an industry. Agropur, the milk co-op in Quebec, would be an example of this. The credit union Desjardins Group is actually a federation. Isn't a federation a co-op? Actually, a federation is a group of organizations. A co-op is a group of people. You see federations of housing co-ops all the time, and government funding requires a housing co-op to be in one. Usually each region has a federation. Quebec even has a federation of those federations. And you can have a federation of federations, which is what you have with the federal level housing co-ops. Housing co-ops have worked so well because they operate in a multi-generational time span. As the aristocracy shows, real estate is a waiting game, and idiot proof. If a housing co-op owns a block of housing in a growing city for a century, all it has to do is maintain the building, pay the bills, and charge rent. It's a lot easier than competing with Amazon, which is what a retail co-op has to do. Most co-ops came from a trade union movement in North America. Organized labor wanted to make sure that workers were being housed, and unions were well positioned to take advantage of the government support for low-income housing. An example of this is the 1926 Limited Dividend Housing Companies Act in New York. It gave tax breaks for building housing if you had regulated rents on units afterwards, and property developers were not interested. Why would a developer want to build a building that was permanently stuck with bargain basement rents? But it made sense to Sidney Hillman from the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. He could give housing to members of the union as a perk. Low rents, low problem. He had wanted those rents to be low anyway. The Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America doesn't exist anymore, but their co-op of 1,500 units is still providing housing for people on a modest income in the Bronx. I can say without reservation, this is a great place to live. There are also student co-ops, which formed around university campuses across the continent. Canada had plenty of both the student co-ops and the union co-ops right from the start. So get ready for the least surprising thing you'll ever hear. Quebec did things quite differently. <laughs> Montreal co-ops really got going in the 1970s and were more grassroots and came from activism. The style was often a bunch of buildings with people living in them being threatened by development. People banded together and fought for a roof. One of the earliest in Côte de Neige ripped off its shirt de brawl in 1975. Many early co-ops in Montreal are uh, groups of old walk-ups for this reason. In fact, you wouldn't even know it was a co-op from the outside. Co-ops in this era were often founded by idealistic middle-class adjacent types. A Concordia geography professor, an artist who makes costumes for Cirque du Soleil, and some students or whatever. 
The most famous fight, which is well documented almost everywhere, including this book, was probably Milton Park. A developer, Concordia Estates Limited, had managed to acquire most of the neighborhood of Milton Park. The developer was demolishing the Victorian era row houses that we all love to build Complex La City. In 1972, a weeks long sit-in occupied their offices, there were arrests and tons of people went to jail. Enter Phyllis Lambert. She was kind of a ringer from a wealthy Montreal family who had just started and funded Heritage Montreal. This would be their biggest project. Around this time, CMHC had made funding available for housing co-ops and Heritage Montreal lended legitimacy to co-ops being an option for these houses. This resulted in the largest housing co-op in North America being formed in 1979. Has Montreal's approach succeeded? Fuck yeah. Montreal is the centre of co-op movement in Canada, with Milton Park a large part of that success story. Quebec has about half the co-ops in Canada, but only about 24% of the co-op units. This is because of those activists rather than union origins, which led to a lot of much smaller co-ops. I think the smaller co-ops are actually closer to the ideal. Lots of co-ops with hundreds of units end up being impersonal and not having a strong community feel, which is a big part of the benefit of being in a co-op. More on that later. So who pays for housing co-ops? Well, from the 1970s onward, Canadian government support kicked in. They quickly became seen as an alternative to housing projects that could help low-income families get under a roof by giving money to some motivated, acceptably communist idealists. The government got a lot of bang for its buck, basically getting a free building manager in the deal at least. In Quebec, all levels of government support starting housing co-ops. The federal government gives their money for allocation to each provincial government. And in Montreal, the breakdown is roughly 40% coming from government of Quebec, 20% coming from the city, and the rest being financed with a long-term mortgage, which you can easily get when you have 60% of a down payment. Essentially, the more low-income housing you have in your co-op, the more money you get. This government funding has a side benefit. It's part of why housing co-ops have long-term, low-income housing in them. The government requires the low-income housing as part of the deal. So even if in many decades the co-op wanted to sell out on its ideals, it would be quite hard to change. It hasn't been all smooth sailing with the funding though. Funding tends to come and go with successive governments. The 90s are always mentioned as a low point. People talk about it like it was fucking Dresden bombing. Dresden is a heap of ruins. It has been smashed to atoms. However, with the current housing affordability crisis, the funding taps are firmly in the on position for the foreseeable future. When people hear corporation, they think of for-profit corporations. But there are many sorts of corporations out there. Housing co-ops are one type of corporation in Canada, just like charities or non-profits. Each province has a cooperatives act, which cooperatives are governed by and keeps track of them in a registry. If a co-op isn't registered with corporate registries, then it isn't a real co-op. Yep. Story time. When I was 11 years old, I used to rent pens in my class under the name Rainbows Lend Limited. This adorable activity was not a limited liability corporation, and a loft you rent with a bunch of hippies is not a co-op. It's a commune, which means nothing. Well, to the law at least. I'm sure it means a lot to you if you live there, but don't use the word co-op, it's confusing and gives people a false sense of security. Here are some words you could use instead to describe you and your roommates. Just like any corporation, a co-op has bylaws and articles of incorporation, which work like the constitution for your co-op. They outline the way your co-op should work and how decisions should be made. One of the most important things in these bylaws is defining the makeup of a board of directors, which you get to vote on every year. You can also expect many significant decisions to be voted on directly, such as changes in those constitutional documents or approving a large expenditure to expand the co-op. The most fundamental part of owning that share though is it gives you membership pricing for your unit. Usually this means you're getting the unit at cost. In order to give things a real communist vibe and help share the decision making, the bylaws of big co-ops usually also define subcommittees. You might have a building maintenance committee who chooses a contractor to repair the roof, or a social committee to organize a barbecue, or a committee to committee committee committee. It's tempting to laugh at these committees, but the reality is being on a committee is a good way to get invested in the co-op without just being on the board of directors. But it also gives you a regular chunk of time talking with other members about something that you're interested in. Team building really can just be as simple as digging a hole. You could start a hole digging committee. A very common committee is the membership committee, which looks at and approves applications for people. This is a big job because there's a huge number of people trying to get a very limited number of spots these days. Membership also involves people leaving. Now say a person in a cooperative is being an asshole. They're smoking crack. They're taking too many sausages from a barbecue. 
They're proposing non-clay bricks be used on the building. <laughs> this guy, he's got to go. The board of a co-op can vote to take the person's shares for a number of reasons. This could be defined as something that the whole co-op has to vote on as well. When they lose their shares, they also lose their special member's pricing. Between the higher price and the stigma, they'll eventually leave. In the meantime though, the co-op gets to make money off them. Woo! See you in the hot tub. All this means living in a co-op becomes less about money and more about who you are. If you're nice to your neighbors and you're a valuable member of the co-op, you're gonna be just fine. Really, it's no trouble at all. When it comes to your property rights, it's not your property. That share is. You can't sell it. There is an investment option, but it's a crappy investment to placate idiots. Must be on property ladder. If you want to invest in something, take the money you're saving by living in a co-op and invest it elsewhere. You usually can't choose who to transfer your share to, so it can't be inherited. But let's say your kid was friends with everyone growing up and then you passed away. The selection committee, blah, 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 they would get in. So you can see the social aspect, right? Be decent and get treated decently. If your kid was some entitled prat who pissed everyone off, they would get kicked out. You just don't get away acting like that to people on a car. Are you sick of the insecurity of being a renter, but don't want to participate in the toilet paper house hoarding of our current era? When it comes to what's good, housing co-ops solve your housing problem without making it worse for others. <laughs> Just trying to wipe their ass. It permanently takes a property out of play. It says, this property, it's not for making money, it's for a community of people to live in. And it's gonna be like that forever. Even when they leave or die, that home goes to another person not on the basis of their wallet, but on the basis of who they are as a person. Generally, altruistic and easygoing people are gonna get awarded first. And I think it's really nice to have a thing in society that works like that. Also, if you don't have the money for a deposit on a house, this gives you a pretty considerable level of security at no cost. Once you get your membership and you make your first payment, you have a secure place. You're not gonna get kicked out if they renovate the property. It's not gonna get sold out from under you. You could easily live out the rest of your days there, provided you are a good member of the community. Housing co-ops also cost less than renting. And here's what's amazing, they also cost less than owning. People in co-ops are expected to contribute their expertise, which saves on certain services. Between that and the government subsidies and the savings from pooling your resources for work, a wealthy person would still be better off living in your average co-op and then buying a house to rent out on the side than buying a house to live in. The community is another beneficial part of being in a housing co-op. Research seems to point to people in co-op being happier. Renting has always been somewhat transient and cold, but owning these days isn't much better. In many places, people are flipping themselves out of having any sense of community. But because of the unbeatable low prices, staying put in the co-op makes a lot of sense. So the community is quite permanent. You get to know people well because you share work and decisions together. And that permanence together with the decision making gives a lot of the community connection that people these days are really craving. As we all now know, isolation, not so fun. They certainly don't work for some people and occasionally the federation that your housing co-op is a member of has to step in to fix a badly run co-op, but it's exceptionally rare. They've just been quietly housing hundreds of thousands of Canadians for decades now. When it comes to what's bad, I've heard that now something like 75% of housing in co-ops is low income, and this creates a number of problems. First, it gives it a stigma, and people of means steer away from it. For many people, this was supposed to be a grand change for society, and it's disappointing to see it become a way to house the poor. But that's not really what the problem is. A friend of mine who started a co-op told me a story that illustrates the problem. They are interviewing several people who are refugees in Canada. And refugees, of course, are one of the groups of people that the government is giving money to housing co-ops to house. And being a group of, you know, modern yuppies, one of the standard questions was, is the environment important to you? And they got the confused response again and again. Yes, the environment here is good. There isn't crime. It's not dangerous. This refugee family and many of the other low-income people coming into housing co-ops didn't sign on to be part of some communal housing revolution. They needed a place to live. And having a subcommittee to make decisions on which composting method to use is a luxury afforded to people who are not experiencing grinding poverty and escaping war. They say the plane, they fly overhead, hey, drop the value. I don't care. In Beirut, plane fly overhead, drop bomb. <laughs> I like this plane. This funding being almost exclusively tied 
to low income housing has changed a mix of housing co-ops so there are less of the critical idealists in the mix. Is this bad? Yeah, I think so. These people who are there for the co-op aspect and not for the low cost aspect do a lot of the heavy lifting on what keeps a co-op running smoothly and well. Also, not having a balanced representation of society in your co-op results in some problems. I've been on several boards and having an accountant or a lawyer sitting next to you is incredibly handy. First, if you don't have certain skill sets on your board, you're gonna be paying for them. And second, at the moment, one of the limiting factors in creating housing co-ops is a lack of motivated people to start and organize them. Starting a co-op requires a lot of property development and legal skills. And let's face it, a lot of the people who have those skill sets and connections to get a co-op started are gonna be fairly well off. All this is to say, loading up the housing co-op movement with responsibility for low-income housing in exchange for a bunch of money has ended up being a bit of a mixed blessing. Do I need to say this? This isn't really a problem with poor people. It's your classic problem of rich people avoiding poor people. The movement needs to figure out how to get a more balanced mix of people starting co-ops in future. And that may mean making a better value proposition for middle-class people. There's so many ways to do that. I'm not gonna list them. But like one example would be, you could make the rent uh, tax write-off for the first decade if you're a founding member of a new co-op. There are lots of decent people out there who are sitting on the fence about housing co-ops but maybe a little concerned about putting hundreds of hours of labor in for nothing. If the aim is to make more of these, why not make it a little bit easier for them financially? Co-ops are also small democratic institutions and need wise leadership to work. Look, we don't know what the world is going to be like in 50 years. We, we could all have been wiped out from disease or the flu. So what's your suggestion? I don't know. I'm just scared. Some co-ops, just like some organizations, end up being really badly led. People disagree over having dogs. Someone bangs someone else's partner. All sorts of things can go wrong. All of these things can and do happen in condos, but a co-op is more social, so they can be made even worse. If a co-op fails and the board is not working or dissolves, then the federation for your region will intervene. But living in a failing co-op is not gonna be fun. It's also why a bad housing co-op is even worse than low-income public housing. Because when a housing co-op isn't working, well, no one's gonna be taking out the trash. Uh, as I always do when I'm doing these videos, I was looking around Google Maps for reviews of housing co-ops, and you can see that the ones that work best are smaller. It's a lot easier to balance the needs and hear all the voices and opinions of 30 people than it is for 300 people. Reading the negative reviews, it's often people who feel disempowered in larger co-ops. They're not friends with people on the board, no one's communicating with them about what's going on, and they don't know why a certain policy exists, etc. It sucks to feel like an outsider in something that's all about being a community. Now, if you're careful, you can get away with 100% government funding when building a new co-op, which sounds like a good thing. No money, great. But if you take only government funding, you'll create another problem. Anything nice isn't gonna be paid for by the government. They only wanna pay for square meters to be used for housing. So it can be really hard if you want a community feeling in a 100 unit co-op, but have no dedicated space for meetings and activities. A completely government funded building also isn't gonna be very nice. It's gonna be cheap. Like the budgie. Having some higher income people is important again, but this time because you can get them to pay in for some reasonable extras, which can be added when the co-op is built. Well, if you have a community-oriented streak, and if you don't just tolerate but actually enjoy the differences between people, then a housing co-op is perfect for you. You don't have to be an extrovert, but you do have to be able to interact with a familiar group of people. Attendance of various meetings will be required, as well as a certain number of hours which are tailored towards your experience. It could be plain old labor, like mowing the lawns and taking out the trash bins. Or if you're a computer technician, you could be doing something like maintaining or setting up the network for the co-op. Each co-op is totally different. Some are targeted at people with different professions. Some are made for families with children. The others are for students and academics. You can search for co-ops by visiting the Federation's website. And I guarantee you that you'll find a co-op that is uncannily well tailored for you. And that's why most of the time, the biggest thing stopping more people from being in co-ops is, can you even get in? The waiting lists are very long at the moment, with dozens of people applying to get into a single unit. The screening process can be quite intense as a result, and units are often reserved for low-income individuals, 
even if they aren't required to anymore by their agreement with the government. Because housing cops are pretty decent people. If you're renting at the moment and have even an inkling of being interested in moving into a housing cop, the time to start looking or forming a housing cop is now, because it's going to take years for either one to get off the ground. I actually think we need to get to the point where housing co-ops are a very common form of housing and where housing isn't seen so universally as an investment. In Canada, over 75% of all national wealth is tied up in real estate. And a lot of that is just another sort of toilet paper. I'm weird enough to have fantasized about what the economy would look like if two trillion more dollars was injected into the share market and our companies rather than just being in these inflated real estate markets. Housing co-ops present a solution to this. They permanently deflate the housing bubble while creating stronger communities. And those are the sorts of mutually invested communities that are the building blocks of a better society. But the problem in getting more housing co-ops started isn't really with the funding. The problem stopping housing co-ops being built is you. <laughs> There are lots of people looking to live in a housing co-op, but you're the one who's watching the long video on how they work. The funding's there, the people without homes are certainly there. Are you? The benefits of starting a housing co-op are real, for you and for your community. And the legacy is a permanent one, that would see generations of people with modest incomes having somewhere to live. Why not send some emails out, and consider getting a group of friends together to talk about starting one? You could even send them this video. And if you're interested in starting a housing co-op, reach out to me on Twitter or hit me up in the comments. And of course, subscribe to stay updated about my own housing co-op developments. That's right, guys. I'm going in.